I'm going to talk today about price elasticity of demand. This is uh, a subject a professor w wrote to me once, said it's like the Roach Motel. Students go in and they can't get out. Uh, they get all confused and, and bollocked up when they start working with elasticity. Uh, I think the reason that pattern emerges is that people try to memorize a bunch of stuff when they think about problems related to elasticity of demand. I'm going to uh, lay out an alternative strategy for you that I'm going to strongly recommend. I can't prevent you, though, from trying to memorize a bunch of rules, but I can tell you that if you do that, you'll probably forget them or misapply them or take too long uh, doing them uh, to, to be effective when you deal with questions about elasticity on the midterm. Here, here's what we're talking about. It's a measure of how responsive the quantity demanded of a good is to a change in its price. If it's highly responsive, we say demand for that good is elastic. If it's not highly responsive, we say demand is inelastic. Those are just vocabulary words. The simplest of the several definitions I'll give you about elasticity is this one. It's the percentage change in the quantity demanded that results from a 1% change in the price of the good. It's a local concept. We're at a point on the demand curve, P and Q. We're going to change the price, but not by much. 1%, I think, in most applications would count as a, a minor change in the price. What's the corresponding percentage change in the quantity demanded of the good? That, uh, if we take that quantity percentage change and divide it by 1%, the, one, the, the price change that gave rise to it, that ratio would be the elasticity of demand at that point. So if a 1% rise in the price of shelter caused a 2% reduction in the quantity demanded, what would the elasticity of demand be? It would be minus 2. Why? Because the percentage change in quantity is 2%. It's a, a negative movement. The percentage change in price was 1%. The movements were in the opposite direction. And so the ratio, percentage change in quantity over 1% change in price, is going to be minus 2. It's always negative if we're talking about downward sloping demand curves. And that's almost always what we will be talking about. And so since the negative sign doesn't really convey any additional useful information, most economists follow the convention of talking about elasticity in terms of its absolute value, a positive number. We don't say the elasticity of demand is minus 2 in most instances, although strictly speaking, it would be a negative number. We don't say the negative number just for convenience. <coughs> Demand is said to be elastic if the elasticity is greater than 1. Again, this is an absolute value. Uh, it's inelastic if the elasticity is less than 1. And it's unit elastic if the elasticity is exactly equal to 1. Those are just vocabulary words. Uh, you, you need to know them. Uh, so I'm not going to complain if anybody memorizes these. What else could you do to learn a vocabulary word uh, if, if not commit it? its meaning to, to memory. Some people find this diagram helpful. If it helps you, good. Highlight it in yellow. Uh, uh, but it's, it's just a summary of what the definitions of elastic and inelastic and unelastic were that I gave you. Here's a more general formula for the elasticity of demand. We're, we're talking about elasticity at a point. All elasticity measures are at a point. It's a local construct. So P is the price at the point. Q is the quantity. And the standard mathematical notation for a small change in something, price, for example, is delta something. So delta P is a small change in price. Delta Q the associated change in the quantity demanded. Associated, what do I mean? It's the change in the quantity demand, demanded that c occurs as a result of the delta P change in price. Um, is it really true that there are, there are no such goods that have a negative, or um, let's say that um, 
the price increases um, that have an increase in demand as a result, because I think there's under goods like Giffen goods, or what's the name again? Um, essential goods. There are Giffen goods. The question is, do, do all goods have downward sloping demand curves? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, there are economists who talk about Giffen goods, goods whose demand curves slope upwards. There aren't any Giffen goods, so we're not going to talk about those. People have tried to find them. Every uh, claim of having found one has been debunked conclusively. Uh, there, there are sometimes examples that give you the impression that we're talking about a Giffen good. There was a report of a, a brewery that was trying to phase out one of its weak selling brands of beer. They knew they would get complaints if they just yanked it from the market. So they had a, a strategy that were going to raise the price gradually and then choke off the, the, the customer uh, demand for it. Uh, and finally, then nobody would complain by the time they took it off the market. And what they discovered, according the, to this tale, I've never seen evidence that it's a true story, was that demand the quantity demanded of the beer rose steadily each time they, they raised the price. Uh, customers mistook it for a craft beer of high quality because it was selling for more, more money. But that's not what generally happens. People talk about the rich. They want to show off. And if the, if the price is higher, that's even better because it, it lets me show off more effectively. Uh, that's a sore point for me. I write about uh, consumption in that stratum uh, often. And that's not the way the rich are, for the most part. Many rich do want to show off their purchasing power. But they don't want to show it off by buying something gratuitously expensive. I don't know if any of you uh, would remember an app once marketed only briefly in the App Store, Apple App Store. It was called I Am Rich. That was the name of the app. It cost $999, uh, and it did absolutely nothing. What you got was an icon that would be amongst the app icons on your home screen. It was an icon in the, in the shape of a bright red ruby with glistening rays coming off of it, and the little uh, moniker under I am rich. It didn't last long. It sold maybe four copies in the week that it was available. Uh, rich people wouldn't be drawn to a product like that. Suppose you were uh, sitting at a bus stop uh, and a guy pulled out his iPhone and you saw that icon. What would you think? Oh, wow, that's an impressive guy. I, I better give him wide berth. No, you'd think, what a jerk. What a jerk. He, he spent $999 on an app that doesn't do anything, just so he could convey to people that he's rich. Well, there are other ways to convey that you're rich by buying something for $999 that does something useful. Why? If you had those two choices, I can buy the I Am Rich app, and people will know I'm rich, or I can buy this other. The, the second one be a, would be a weaker signal because they could say, well, I just bought it because it was useful. But uh, if it's expensive enough, it's a strong single si signal to people that you have purchasing power. And why wouldn't you rather buy something useful than something that's completely useless? Uh, so I, I think the idea of these upward sloping demand curves, that's not something we're going to worry about. Yeah, that, I don't think there are any. OK, so we've got. The small change in price that causes a small change in, in quantity. What's elasticity? It's the percentage change in quantity that results from the corresponding percentage change in price. And schematically, that means delta Q, the change in quantity divided by the original quantity, that fraction over the corresponding fraction in price, the percentage change. This isn't really, strictly speaking, the percentage change in price. What is this? This is the percentage change in price expressed as a fraction between 0 and 1. Here's the percentage change in quantity expressed as a fraction. If we really want the percentage changes, you'd have to multiply each of those by 100. That would give you the percentage changes. But then the hundreds would cancel out. So if I want to say that's the percentage change in quantity, 
over the percent cha change in price. I'm literally correct to say that. That's what, that's what we've got in that formula. Okay. I, I don't know what grade you would have been in uh, these days to learn this. Uh, but at some point in elementary school, you learned how to divide two fractions. So you got A over B divided by C over D. What do you do when you have, when you have that problem to solve? Uh, the way they summarized the rule when I was in elementary school was you invert and multiply. You take the fraction on the bottom, you flip it, put the, the denominator on top and the numerator on the bottom, and then multiply that flipped fraction times the fraction on top. If you do that, that's what that qu quotient actually ends up being. And so we do that. There's, there's the original uh, percentage change in quantity divided by percentage change in price in the middle of line two on the slide. Just by rearranging the terms uh, through this uh, invert and multiply maneuver, I get a different expression all in one line, delta Q over delta P times P over Q. And those uh, expressions have meaning geometrically. Delta P over delta Q is the slope of the demand curve, the change in the vertical direction divided by the change in the horizontal direction. So delta Q over delta P is the reciprocal of that. It's one over the slope of the demand curve. There's one over the slope. And P over Q, that's just P over Q. Now I've got a new expression for the elasticity of demand. I don't have to do a whole lot of work now. I just look at the demand curve, see what the slope is, take the reciprocal of that, one over it, and multiply that times P over Q, and I've got immediately a number that's the elasticity of demand at the point PQ. Let's see how it works. What's the elasticity of demand at point A? Start with the slope of the demand curve. What is the slope of this demand curve? Two, rise over run. Uh, you got to dig back into your memory bank to, to, for some of you to, to, to use this material, but most of you had that at some point. The slope of a straight line, it's the change in the vertical distance per corresponding run of the horizontal distance. So rise over run, 10 over 5, 2. 1 over the slope, 1 half. Easy. P over Q, we just look at the graph and see what it is. It's 4 thirds. So. 1 over the slope times P over Q. What's that? Everyone can do it and get 2 thirds without breaking a sweat. That ends up being useful. If you remember what similar triangles are, those are triangles that have the same angles, same three angles, each, each one of them, you can prove that the elasticity of demand at A is also equal to the length of that line between here and the point A divided by the length of the line from A up to the verti vertical intercept. Do that as an exercise if you're inclined to. If you don't like doing exercises like that, don't do it. You won't, I won't ask you to prove that uh, in anything we do on a task, but you know, that's a relationship that's also helpful and is a shortcut to get you the elasticity estimate you're looking for. What's the elasticity of demand at the point D in this diagram? Well, if you use that segment length uh, formula I just said to use, here would be that length and I say the elasticity is that length divided by that length. What would that ratio be? It would be one third. Is that right? Is, it, is that formula right? That the ratio of those two lengths would be the elasticity? Let's check. Is the elasticity of demand here 3, 2, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, or one third? Well, what we know is that it's P over Q times 1 over the slope. The slope is 100 over 200 
that's one half, so one over the slope is two. The, the point itself has the ratio P over Q, 25 over 150, that's one six. So two times one six is one third. It worked, lo and behold. What's the elasticity at point B? Three. Did you do it by, as the ratio of the two relevant segments? That's one way to do it. It's the ratio of this line to this line. This li the bottom segment B, from B to E is three times as long as the segment from A to B. That suggests that the elasticity is three. Uh, if you would actually do the calculation and do P over Q times one over the slope, you would get three that way too. So P over Q is 75 over 50, that's three halves. The slope is still one half, one over the slope is two, so two times three halves, that's three. The elasticity can jump right out at you with, with no work if you are attentive to the geometric interpretation of it. If you want to grind through formulas, you can do that too, but this is quicker. So it's a good, it's a good shortcut to have at your disposal. Okay, notice this. If we're talking about a straight line demand curve, the slope is everywhere the same. That's the defining feature of a straight line. If the slope is everywhere the same, what happens to one over the slope as we move up and down along the demand curve? It's the same. It doesn't change. If the slope's the same, one over the slope is the same. What happens to P over Q as we move up and down the demand curve? Is it the same no matter where? No. No, it's changing. What's happening to it as I move downward along the demand curve? P over Q. P's big, Q's small. P's getting smaller, Q's getting bigger. The ratio is getting smaller as I move down the demand curve. What is it at the vertical intercept of the demand curve? What's that ratio? It's infinite. It's whatever the number is here, I haven't given it to you, but you don't need it because you know the number here is zero, the Q is zero, so some positive number over zero, that's, inf that's infinity, I say. Is it, are there any math majors in the room? Maybe you're unhappy if I say that. Oh, you can't divide by zero, that's not a legitimate numerical operation. I'm a math major, uh, and I just divide by zero, and I, I called it infinity, and there's no harm to anyone for me doing that in, in, in this class. It's a totally okay thing for our purposes to do that. Why? Because P over Q, that ratio, is getting bigger and bigger, and we can get it bigger than any number you can name by getting closer and closer to the, the vertical axis. It's just, it doesn't matter whether we call it infinity or not, but it's easier just to say it's infinite and, and use that for convenience. What's the ratio here, P over Q? Zero. Zero. So what's the elasticity of demand here? It's infinite. It's falling, it's falling, it's falling, it's zero down here. So that's the, the, the clearest indication I could offer you that elasticity of demand is a local concept. It's different at every point, at least if we're talking about a straight line demand curve. It's different at every point. So if you say, what's the elasticity of demand? Implicit in that is an understanding that you're not talking about huge changes in price. It's a local concept. The elasticity of demand near point A is the number we get. Uh, but if we go too far from A, the, the elasticity would be different. Here are two polar cases, the infinitely elastic demand curve and the completely inelastic demand curve. Raise the price here, nobody responds at all. Uh, here, the price uh, is set and people will buy as much or as little as they choose to at that price. 
raise the price, they won't buy anything. Why would anybody lower the price? They're already able to sell as much as they want. The elasticity here, infinite. How did I get that? Because the slope is zero, one over the slope times any p over q is in infinity. Uh, it's good enough for our, our purposes. Here, the slope is infinite, so one over the slope is zero. Elasticity of demand is zero on that curve. We won't see too many examples of these extreme cases, except when we get to the competitive firm. Competitive firms often face a demand for their product that looks horizontal in the way showed, but that's for a later time. Why do we use elasticity instead of just measuring the sensitivity to price by the slope of the demand curve? The flatter the demand curve is, the bigger the change in the quantity demanded will be if we change the price. So slope, everybody knows what the slope of a line is. Uh, most people who've never studied any economics have no idea what the elasticity is. Why use this more complicated formula when we could use the slope perfectly well to measure how sensitive the quantity demanded is to a change in price. Why do we do that? Well, it turns out that here, it's actually more informative to use percentage uh, uh, reckonings than to use absolute value reckonings when we're trying to get a grip on what it means to be sensitive or insensitive to changes in price. Here's the demand for gasoline. I've got price per gallon uh, as the measure of its, its price on the vertical axis, gallons per day as the quantity measure. What's the elasticity of demand at the point C there? And do you have a sense for what the resulting answer means? Well, how, how would you determine the elasticity of demand? What's the slope of this demand curve? It's rise over run. What's the rise over run? I don't give you this number. How would you know the run? Well, you'd say it's the same along any segment. So it falls one, it runs 50, the slope is 1 50th. What's 1 over the slope? It's 50. What's 1 over the slope times p over q? Well, p over q is 3 over 50. 50 times 3 over 50 is 3. So what I see immediately after hardly any work is that if there's a 1% increase in price, there'll be a 3% reduction in the quantity demanded. If there's a 1% decrease in price, there'll be a 3% increase in the quantity demanded. I, I got an intuitive sense, sense of what's going on when I hear numbers like that. Here's the same demand curve where I'm measuring price not in dollars per gallon, but dollars per ounce. The slope of the demand curve is 0.000156625. That's the correct slope. Uh, rise over run, measured in these units, that's, that's the number you get. What does that tell you about how responsive the demand for gasoline at that point would be to a change in price? I have no idea what that number means about responsiveness. Does, does anybody? Uh, you could say, well, we already calculated it. It means a 3% uh, uh, change in the quantity amount per 1% uh, change in price. Yeah, you already knew that, but you d wouldn't know that unless you had used the elasticity uh, to, to know that 3% would be the response. Here, this number is just uninformative. So you go down to the Kmart to buy the cheaper version of the product. Don't use percentage amounts to think about that problem. You want to know how responsive the quantity demanded is to a change in the price? You think about that more clearly if you use percentage magnitudes to, to describe the, the changes that you have in mind. Questions about any of this? Uh, this isn't hard. Uh, you know, there's nothing that you've seen that would be, would have kept you out of the Johnson School because you couldn't do things like that. Uh, there's nothing here. It, it's still stuff that people make errors on uh, because they don't really really get practiced at it and familiar with it. Here's some sample estimates of elasticity of demand. 
people have worked hard to get these estimates. How do they get them? Well, they would study, for example, the market for green peas. And they would look at a lot of different conditions. They would say sometimes they sell for 49 cents a pound and the quantity is whatever it is, and other times it's 53 cents. Each one of those data points they get when they're doing their study is the intersection of two different supply and demand curves. If you're trying to estimate the price elasticity of demand, you need to have a formula for the demand curve. There are lots of demand curves. Demand curves shift in and out. Uh, supply curves shift in and out. The data you have are intersections of supply and demand curves, and it takes a very clever econometrician to parcel out the information that would let you estimate what the elasticity of demand would be for the product at an average price quantity pair from your sample. Uh, that's why if somebody asks you what's the elasticity of the demand for your product, you say we're going to hire an economic consulting firm to give us an estimate of that. Because you don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. It's hard. You can do it, but it's hard. And it's approximate. You wouldn't get a very precise answer. But there are some numbers. Uh, I got these from published studies. Why is the lowly green pea uh, such that when its price goes up a little bit, people run for the hills? They, they, I'm not buying green peas anymore. They just got 1% more expensive. 3% of us desert the, the product. Theater tickets, price goes up, we hardly budge. What's going on? Substitution is part of the story. Yeah. Uh, you want to eat green peas, then the price of green peas goes up. What do you do? Oh, woe is me. I'm going to starve? No, that's not your response. You say, all right, green peas got more expensive. What else you got? Kale. Uh, <laughs> green beans. Uh, spinach. There are lots of things you could eat instead of green peas that would do roughly the same job for you. Uh, and so you, you, you switch to something else and you don't feel all that aggrieved about it. You're, you're trying to achieve an objective. Green peas help you achieve your objective. Are, are there other ways to achieve that same objective? Yeah, just eat similar other foods whose price didn't go up if, if the price of green peas goes up. Ross. The previous example was a number drawn out of thin air. Yeah, it was not. Uh, it's the, the estimates vary, uh, and some of them show it to be slightly elastic. Some of them show it to be slightly inelastic. I've never seen an estimate as high as three. Yeah, that was not meant to be an indication of it. Theater tickets. You want to see Hamilton. They raise the price. How could they raise the price? The price is already in infinity. Uh, <laughs> what do you do? Well, there's not a really good substitute for seeing Hamilton. If that's what you wanted to do, you can't go see Raiders of the Lost Ark again. That's, you could do that, but that's not the same. You know, that doesn't achieve the goal you were trying to achieve in quite the same way. Uh, there may be other factors involved in, in the theater ticket example. We're going to look more sy systematically at the factors that govern how elastic the demand for a good will be uh, as we go through. But the real reason we're interested in elasticity is because there's a clear link between how elastic the demand for a good is and what happens to the amount people spend on it when we change the price. And I'm going to show you that relationship, and I'm going to urge you not to write down rules and memorize them. There, there will be some rules, uh, but I think I probably know the rules now. I'm, I'm not sure. If somebody asked me uh, shortly after I woke up to list the rules I'm going to show you, I'm not sure I could get it right. But I'm sure I wouldn't miss one of the questions that I might ask you about these rules. 
So it's going to be kind of like the advice I gave you uh, when it comes to answering questions about what happens when uh, income goes up, what happens to the, the, the price and quantity of a good sold. Uh, you, if, you, if you just can remember to apply the basic logic of the model, then you don't need to remember the rules for what happens under what circumstances. You can derive them on the fly. And, and that means you really know them. They're yours. You're not, they're not, if, if you memorized them, they, you, you can be sure of this. Next semester, you'd, you would have long forgotten them. Uh, so you want to know, if you raise the price of your product, will people spend more on it, or will they spend less on it? Let's put it in a context. Uh, you're the toll booth ad, or the toll administrator for the Golden Gate Bridge. And the, the bridge needs painting more often than you thought, and so uh, you, your budget's running low. You need to raise more money. How can I raise more money, you want to know? Well, what should I do? If you knew the elasticity, you would know what to do. You hire a consulting firm, and they tell you that the elasticity of demand for trips across the bridge is 2.0. What does that mean? A 1% change in the price will mean a 2% change in the number of trips. All right, so if you raise the price of your tolls from a dollar, uh, at which price 100,000 trips per hour occur, what's going to happen if the price elasticity is 2? The number of trips is going to, a 10% increase in price is going to reduce the number of trips by 20%. There won't be 100,000 trips, there will be 80,000 trips. And if there are 80,000 trips, each one paying $1.10, the revenue you'll collect will be $88,000 per hour. That's $12,000 per hour less than you were collecting in the first place. So if your goal was to raise more money, you shot yourself in the foot. You didn't raise more money, you ended up with less money. Why? Because elasticity of demand was greater than one, and when you raise your price, when elasticity is greater than one, you lose revenue from doing that. Well, maybe the elasticity could have been a different number. Maybe the consultant would do the study and come back and tell you that it's not two, it's 0.5. Again, these are absolute values. How would the number of trips and total revenue, which is equal to total expenditure, uh, of course, Ch uh, change if you raised your tolls by 10% in this case. Well, you're up to $1.10. The number of trips would fall by 5%, so you were at 100,000, now you're at 95,000. What's total revenue? It's $1.10 times 95,000 trips per hour. That is $104,500 per hour. You raised your revenue as a result of raising your fare at 10%. The only difference was the elasticity of demand assumed in the two cases. If you, if you had elastic demand, raising your revenue was going to cost you money. If you had inelastic demand, raising, uh, raising your price uh, would raise you more money. So you want to memorize some rules? Here are some rules. A price reduction will increase total revenue if and only, only if the price lack elasticity of demand is greater than one. An increase in price <clears throat> will increase total revenue if and only if the price elasticity of demand is less than one. All right, those are rules for increasing total revenue. You can write the rules for decreasing total revenue. They're derived easily from these. Then you got four rules to, to keep uh, in your head. Highlight them in yellow all you want. You're going to mess up when you try to remember those rules. I promise you, you'll, you'll mess up. Not everybody, but many of you will mess up trying to remember those rules. What you need to know is the logic of the relationship between elasticity and changes in price and changes in total revenue. On a demand curve, a straight line demand curve, above the midpoint, all points have elastic demand. If you reduce your price there, in, in that case, you're going to increase total expenditure. If you're on the bottom half of the demand curve, 
a price reduction is going to reduce total expenditure. If you're in the middle, what's elasticity there? It's one. Remember the claim, which I didn't prove for you, but which I invited you to prove if you wanted to, that the elasticity at a point is the ratio of that segment to the remaining segment up to the top. And at the midpoint, that ratio is going to be one. So elasticity is one in the middle. At that point, total expenditure is as high as it could possibly be on this demand curve. That's the price that would make the total expenditure the biggest it could possibly be. So one way to think about the relationship between demand and, and total expenditure is to recognize that at the middle, total expenditure is at a, ma uh, a maximum. Then if you can remember that elasticity is greater than one on the top part of the demand curve, you would know whether you're moving toward the maximum or away from the maximum if you lowered or increased your price. That's one way to think about it. And you would correspondingly know that if you were here and you raised your price, what would happen to your total revenue? Go up. You're moving towards the maximum. If you reduce your price, you're moving away from the maximum. It would go down. Total revenue, if we plotted it along the, the uh, uh, quantity axis would be a U-shaped curve with its maximum in the middle. That's one way to think about it. Here's, a, here's, I think, an even more intuitively compelling way to think about it. We've got the elasticity concept. What does it mean? It means price goes up, quantity goes down, price goes down, quantity goes up. That's the demand curve. The elasticity tells you something about when price goes up, does quantity go, go down by a little or a lot? If quantity goes down by a lot, we're talking about an elastic demand. If price goes down by a little and quantity goes up by a lot, that's the same thing. It's elastic demand. So which moves more, price or quantity? If it's elastic, quantity moves more in per percentage terms. If it's inelastic, price moves more. So if you have an elastic good, always price and quantity move in the opposite direction. You don't need to remember that. Price goes up, quantity goes down by much more in percentage terms. And total expenditure is the product of these two, that times that. The bigger arrow wins. Price is going up, that's making total revenue go higher. Quantity is going down, that's making it go lower. If you can just remember that for elasticity, for elastic uh, demand, quantity dominates, then you know that the Q movement is going to be the, the determinant of what happens to the product of those two. Anyway, that's helpful to me. I don't memorize any of these rules. Uh, I, I'm not sure I could recite them for you uh, verbatim if you caught me uh, in an odd moment, but I can get these questions right without effort. And so can you. But if you just remember rules, maybe, maybe you won't get them right. So, so don't, don't remember the rules as your strategy. Questions about any of this? A lot of people look at that graph and they say, huh? Uh, so I'm not saying it's necessarily that thinking about this graph would help you. Maybe it won't help you. Uh, everybody has their own style of absorbing information and processing it. So find what works for you and go with that. Here's, I think, a more uh, intuitively clear way still uh, to see what's going on. We're up at $12 per square yard on this shelter market. How many units are we selling at a price of 12? Well, the demand curve says four square yards a week. Revenue, 12 times four, 48. If we cut our price, we'll sell more. We'll sell not four, but six units of shelter, and the revenue will be 10 times six, or 60, 12 more than before. We're in the elastic part of the demand curve. We cut our price. We got more revenue. Why do we get more revenue? Because when we cut our price, we get less money f from the units we were selling already. So 
I was getting $12 each for these four units I had been selling. Now I'm only getting 10. I lost eight bucks on those four units. But I sold two more units at a price of 10. That's 20 extra bucks. So 20 to the, to the plus side, minus eight, I got 12 more in revenue than before. If you would draw the same revenue rectangles down on the bottom half of the demand curve, you'd see that the money you lose by uh, cutting your price is bigger by far than the money you gain by selling more units. This relationship is not mysterious. If you understand what elasticity means, which really just means knowing what the definition of it is, these are the results you would expect to see from your understanding of the concept. But the way economics is taught in this country, people highlight the four rules and then try to answer questions about them. And even if they can remember them when the test comes, they'll forget them shortly thereafter. And then elasticity, what's that? It's the Roach Motel. Students go in, they can't get out. Uh, it, it's, it's not a useful concept unless you can carry it around with you and apply it in real time to things that you think about. If it's, if it's a distant, foggy memory of a rule, it, it won't be useful to you. But it's a very useful concept. Why not get it into your brain in a way that will be retrievable and, and applicable when you run into chances to apply it? Again, look at the reduction in revenue from selling the goods you were selling, now at a lower price, Contrast that with the gain in revenue you get from selling additional goods that you weren't selling before. A midterm question. A midterm question. Can people answer a question like this? If you understand elasticity at even the most minimal level, you'll get this. A director of a big bus company said, for each 1% fare hike, we lose 0.2% of our riders. We can conclude that, and then there are five statements. And your task is to pick the best one, the, best, the one that's most like something that you could conclude from the information given. I'll start at the bottom. No, uh, I'll do a little work first. I'll ask, well, does the information given tell me anything about the elasticity? It sure does. What is the elasticity? What's, what's the numerical value of it based on this information? Sorry? Minus 5? No, it's not minus 5. 0.2. It's the percentage change in quantity that results from a 1% increase in the price or change in the price. Uh, or if he'd given us a, a 2% change in price, we would say it's the percentage change in quantity divided by the 2% change in price. The elasticity is 0.2 in this example, full stop. Does anybody think it's a different number? That's just knowing that first definition, the simplest one uh, of elasticity. All right, now he says a fair increase will increase total revenue. So demand is inelastic. Price moves. Does quantity move more or less than the price moves? Price goes up. Quantity, does it go down by a little or a lot more than? It goes, pr price goes up, quantity goes down a little bit. Which dominates? The price. And so a fair increase will, in, uh, will increase total revenue? No, it's going to make total revenue go down, not up. Right? 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 What's the matter with that? I said you'd never get it wrong if you did it the way I said it. It's, it's inelastic. The price goes up. Does the quantity go up more or less? Price goes up. Quantity goes down a little bit. So the price effect dominates the quantity effect. Can you make a mistake? You can always make a mistake. Uh, <laughs> But if you, if you know what elasticity means and the price 
movement is bigger than the quantity movement, you'll know that the product of the two is going to be driven uh, by the bigger movement. Okay? Revenue is going to go down here if, if we raise the, the price. It goes up. It goes up. It goes up. <laughs> all right. You're all awake. A, a fair increase. You're raising the price. Quant what if quantity didn't move at all? Uh, of course, then the revenue would go up. So if quantity moves just imperceptibly, as it does here, revenue is going to go up. That statement, therefore, has a strong attractor value to it. You want to say that's true. Uh, well, it's a 1% fair height. Maybe that's such a big move away from the local point that elasticity is different. Than my, oh, you could make arguments. But, but I kind of like that response, that, that A response. What about the B response? Let's, maybe more than one of these is true. We need to work our way through the list. A fair increase will increase total revenue. Uh, excuse me. Demand for bus service will go up as fares increases. If anybody picked that, I, I would uh, argue you should lose three points for picking that. Uh, you shouldn't just not get credit. You should lose three points. That would mean the demand curve for bus service slopes up. Uh, no, that, that, that's not OK to pick that. Demand is price elastic. We just showed it was inelastic. That's not a good choice. A 10% fare height will produce a 20% reduction in riders. That's an elastic demand, too. Price elasticity is minus five. No. Doesn't B use the wrong term? Shouldn't it be the quantity demanded will go up? Because the way it's worse. So it's even worse. Yeah. yeah. So it so, should be minus five points. Yeah, minus five points if you pick that one. Yeah, you've, you've con confused a change in demand with a change in the quantity demanded. Yeah, very good point. It's an even worse answer than if it had said uh, the quantity demanded for bus service will go up as fares increase. It's, it's, it's wrong twice over. So that's, that's elasticity. Uh, what if I said that the director of the bus service had told you for every 1% fare hike, we lose 0.5% of our total revenue? Could you figure out what the elasticity was then? Yeah, you, you could. You could work that out. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know what form the question will come to you in, but it's, it, these are doable questions if, you, if you're on top of this. Okay, what determines whether a good will be demanded elastically or not? So the, the most important factor is uh, the, you're thinking about what job you're trying to accomplish. I'm buying this good to help me achieve some goal. Uh, if there is some other good I could buy that would help me achieve the same goal almost as effectively uh, for, for no increase in expenditure, I'll, I'll shift from what I'm buying now to that other goal. But if there isn't a, a good substitute, then maybe I'll just keep buying what I'm buying. Now, let me ask, how many of you have ever had to take the sequence of inoculations uh, that they prescribe after you've been bitten by a rabid or potentially rabid animal? Has anyone? Nobody. Great. Uh, oh, you have. It's painful. Uh, it, you, you don't want to do it. But why did you do it if it's painful then? If you don't do it, you die a horrible uh, de <laughs> death from rabies. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not an easy death. It's a really miserable exit from the world. And so... Uh, it's going to cost you $100 to get these rabies inoculations. Yeah, well, of course I'm going to, I'm going to do them. Uh, oh, sorry, I misread the label. It's 110 Do you say, oh, well, in that case, uh, <laughs> in, that, in that case, I'll do lemon water for a few days and hope for the best. <laughs> no, 110 all right, I'll do it. 120 I'll do it. And they keep raising the price. You, you still do it because there's no substitute for the rabies vaccine. And most societies, if somebody can't afford it, they figure out a way to get it to you anyway. And the government will pay for it. Most societies. No substitutes, highly inelastic. 
you don't want to not get the shots because the price is high because the substitute uh, option is so unsatisfactory. Salt. Everybody bought salt in the last 10 days, I'm guessing, or most of you did. If you cook at home, you probably bought supplies when you got back. How much did you pay for your salt? Mumbai, do you remember? A dollar and something? And how much, how much did it weigh, the container? Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, and uh, what happened, so say it was a dollar. What, what would you have done if it had said a dollar twenty? You still would have bought it. You use salt. Well, you know, your, your steak tastes better if you use salt on it than if it doesn't use salt on it. It hardly costs anything. Uh, and if they raise the price of it, what are you going to say? Well, what shall I do instead? Uh, I'll squirt lemon on my steak. Uh, that's a substitute. You know, some people who are salt phobes uh, already do that. It's not a very good substitute. If you've ever tried that, uh, some, some other uh, consumer might say, oh, well, then I'll use potassium chloride if you're going to raise the price of <laughs> sodium chloride. That's not a good substitute either. Uh, salt doesn't have any good substitutes, really. And so when the price of it goes up, hardly anything happens. A 1% increase in the price of salt produces a 0. 000000 on out uh, for a long time, 1% change in the quantity demanded. It does, people don't, don't respond to it, partly because there are no close substitutes for it. That's probably the most important reason. But that suggests that if we're talking about salt in general, the answer to the question might be different than if we were talking about a particular brand of salt. So suppose you're looking at the, at the salt offerings at Wegmans, and there are two brands on offer. Mr. Gouda's table, table salt uh, and Morton salt. And they raise the price of the Morton salt. And it's your belief that Mr. Gouda's salt is just as good. What do you do? You don't buy the Morton's. You buy Mr. Gouda's. So the demand for Morton salt would be much more elastic than the demand for salt more generally. If you talk about the demand for Morton salt in a specific location, it's more elastic still. So Morton salt at Wegmans, they raise the price of it. You got two, two substitution possibilities. You can buy Mr. Gouda's, or you can go to Tops next door and get Morton for the same low price as before. So uh, the amount of substitutability depends on how Broadly, you define the product cat category. Yeah. yeah. Um, we used this example in a previous economics class that I took, the salt example. Yeah. And one of the reasons, one of the like determinants of elasticity that we identified was that it was a low proportion of a person's total budget. Is that is that like does that fall into the category of one of the decision making? About earlier, or no, that no, no, that's exactly a relevant observation, and it is a good segue into uh, the next point I intended to make, which is that the, <laughs> the bigger the budget share for the item, the more you're going to respond to it when the price changes. Salt occupies hardly any share of your budget. What's the share of your annual expenditure budget that salt occupies? Uh, if it's significant, uh, you're in deep trouble. Uh, uh, that means you <laughs> the denominator of your budget fraction is really, really too small to live comfortably. Uh, and and when, when it's a big budget share, it does affect your decisions. Uh, my three most uh, recent sabbaticals have been to Stanford, the the, the southern part of the Bay Area in California, Paris, and New York City. In each of those cases, uh, we lived in substantially smaller living spaces than we live in here. We could have afforded to live in as much space as we live in here, but it would have been a real strain to do that. And so we may do with smaller living space. That's what people do 
when they confront a higher price and it's a big share of their budget, they respond by substituting. You, you don't have to live in a big space. You can live in a smaller space. And people in New York do live in smaller spaces. And even the very wealthy in New York live in smaller living spaces. Not because they can't afford it, not because it's a big share of their budget. The billionaires in New York City could buy the whole building, never mind living on the top four fo floors. That's, that would be uh, uh, unnecessary. They could live in all 40 floors of the building uh, if they wanted to, but they don't. Why don't they? In Dallas, they would. Uh, why don't they? Because in New York, everybody lives in smaller spaces, almost everybody, because housing is so expensive there that everybody economizes as much as they, they comfortably can on living space and beyond that in, in many cases. And so the frame of reference for what constitutes adequate living space is just different in New York. If you live in 8,000 square feet, that feels like a lot of space in New York. If you're a billionaire in Cincinnati, that's, that's cramped feeling to you because all your fellow billionaires, they live in 30,000, 40,000 square feet. Standards depend on price, even for the people for whom price, at least theoretically, would be a no object. It's, there, there's a richer set of conclusions we can draw here than, than just the, the simplest possible ones. The price elasticity of demand for cigarettes is much higher for teenagers for precisely the reason, do you call yourself Peter John? Uh, Peter John suggested it's a much bigger share of their budget than it is for an adult. A, an adult buys cigarettes, it's a small fraction of the adult's budget. A, a kid buys cigarettes, it, it, it's maybe even more than the total disposable income of many kids. Uh, they want to smoke, but they can't, because they can't afford it. The people who work for the Tobacco Institute, do you know what it is? It's a, it, they describe themselves as a public policy research institute. They are tobacco whores, uh, the people who work there. Uh, they testify in hearings before Congress about uh, many things, but among them, uh, they testify in opposition to taxes on cigarettes. They say, don't bother taxing cigarettes because uh, the research evidence dictates clearly that the determinants of whether somebody will smoke isn't the price of cigarettes, it's the number of people in his or her peer group that smoke. So if 90% of your friends smoke, you're going to smoke. Price low, price high, almost doesn't matter. That's what they say. Think about the application of that argument applied to kids. How much does a pack of 20 Camel regular unfiltered cigarettes cost? Does anybody know? Seven In, bucks. Seven bucks. Uh, 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 I'm glad nobody knows. Uh, uh, does, does anybody know how much any brand of cigarettes costs when you buy it over the counter? these days. It's around $10, 12 $14, depending on where you live. If you're a teenager, uh, maybe 90% of your friends smoke. I don't know where they're getting the money to do it, but there might be uh, at least one or two teenagers in every group who would say, yeah, all my friends smoke. I wish I, that's cool. I wish I could smoke. I can't afford it. All right, so I'll, I, I won't buy any. I'll just bum from my friends. Well, after a while, if you say, can I have a cigarette? And you never ever are a supplier of cigarettes that people will begin to avoid you. They won't want to keep supplying you with free cigarettes. And so you may be uh, forced to say, well, I, I just can't continue smoking. I can't afford to do it. But think about what that means. That means every peer group uh, that you're a member of, each per person is a member of probably 20 peer groups, you know 20 people, each of them knows a different set of people, so you're, you're in multiple peer groups. Every one of those 20 peer groups that you're in now has a lower proportion of smokers in it than before because you, you quit smoking because you couldn't afford it because of the tax. And when the, the, the extra people quit smoking because of that lower proportion 
disruption in, in their peer group who smokes, others will quit smoking and others still will be influenced by that reduction to be less likely to take up smoking in the first place. So if the Tobacco Institute witnesses want to get before Congress and say, it's all peer group uh, membership uh, that determines whether you smoke, that cuts uh, in two ways. Uh, they can't run from the implication that if we raise the tax and it has any effect at all, it's going to be multiplied many times over by the peer effect that they're citing as a reason not to tax smoking. It's a huge effect. And if you want to have an intelligent discussion of public policy, you have to recognize what the effects you're trying to achieve are. I have four adult sons. None of them smokes. I'm delighted by the fact that none of them smokes. I told a friend once that if they had grown up when I grew up, Two of them would have been smokers. At least two of them would have been smokers. I firmly believe that. When I grew up, 80% of men smoked. My parents smoked. They didn't want me to smoke, but they were ill-positioned to explain to me that I shouldn't smoke as they're sitting there smoking. <laughs> I'm delighted that they don't smoke. Uh, one of my sons was present uh, when I made this uh, remark to a, a friend, and he said, which two? He wanted to know which, he wanted to know which two. I said, well, uh, I think uh, David would have smoked, almost for sure. That's my oldest son. Hayden, my youngest son, he would, have, he would have been a smoker. And he said, well, what about me? I said, well, I didn't think you, you'd be a smoker. Yeah, if I'd grown up when you grew up, I'd for sure have been a smoker. He was, he was outraged that I, <laughs> that I didn't think he was cool enough to have been, have been a smoker if he'd grown, grown up under those circumstances. Uh, but think about it. Do you know any parents whose, whose hope in life is that, oh, I'm, I'm really hoping my kids will grow up to be smokers? I, I don't know a parent who would be anywhere near a sentiment like that. We have data on a lot of this. 93% uh, of people who do smoke wished uh, fervently that they had never started smoking. Most of them have tried several times to quit smoking. It's hard to quit smoking. I started smoking when I was 14. Uh, I could buy a pack of Camel cigarettes, regular Camel unfiltered cigarettes, for 25 cents when I started smoking. Uh, 25 cents was a lot more money then than it is now, but it was nothing like 10, 11, 12, 14 dollars a pack is now. It's way more expensive even in real terms to buy cigarettes now. I would not have started smoking uh, if I had been uh, confronted with 10 dollars a pack price of cigarettes. For sure I wouldn't have started smoking. It, I, I read a book, uh, as a senior in high school, I, I read a book named Smoking in Health by Alton Oshner, MD, uh, and, and he, each tap, chapter showed how smoking devastated yet another organ in your body. Uh, and uh, I thought, ooh, that doesn't sound good. And so I resolved at age 17 to quit smoking. And I did quit smoking at age 17. Then, as a sophomore in college, I smoked for a semester. I actually found it fairly easy to quit smoking, uh, uh, and so I quit. I, but since it had been easy, uh, and I was hanging around with a lot of people who smoked in college, I said, well, why not smoke for a little while, uh, since it's so easy to quit? So I, <laughs> since I, so I started smoking. I smoked for about six months, and I said, oh, that's, this, I really shouldn't be doing this. I quit again. Then once later, about 15 years later, I smoked briefly when I was in a stress period of life, uh, and I quit again, that, that time for the last time. But uh, nobody who's quit looks back and says, oh man, I wish I was still smoking. No, no, people don't, don't think that. So is it a legitimate goal for a parent to say, I, I hope my kids grow up to be non-smokers? That seems like a totally normal sentiment for a parent to have. You want your kids to be healthy and long-lived, as far as we know, smoking interferes with the achievement of, of those goals. Uh, 
And so is it justified that we coerce people not to smoke? Here's where the, the individual rights people get upset about the fact that we are trying to coerce people not to smoke. And the justification that's typically offered for doing it is smoking causes harm to others, and then they'll parade out scientists who's, who have studied the effects of secondhand smoke and say it's harmful to others when they breathe in smoke that smokers have exhaled. Uh, the evidence about that is completely unpersuasive. If you sit next to somebody at a bus stop who is smoking, your life will not be compromised by the smoke you breathe that that person exhales. It's not going to help you, but it's, it may, and maybe you won't like the smell of it. You know, it might, might be things that, that would be negative about it, but it's not going to make you less healthy. If you work in a bar, an eight-hour shift, and 90% of the patrons in the bar are chain smokers, and you don't have a, a good ventilation system in the bar, yes, we will have measurable health effects then. And so you might want to say that's grounds for regulating smoking in bars or, or other closed spaces. The harm to others is not from secondhand smoke. When I talk to my libertarian friends, I like to needle them by saying, I'm a libertarian too. And they scoff. How could anybody who favors the government regulations I know that you favor call himself a libertarian? I am a libertarian. I am a John Stuart Mill libertarian. Uh, some of you might know what that is, but if you don't know what that is, that means you think the only legitimate reason the government can tell you you can't do what you want to do is to prevent you from causing undue harm to others. Leave me alone. Does that mean I can do whatever I want? No, I can't uh, start a fire under your house. I can't, I can't steal your bike. I can't hit you in the face. Or, you know, I, I can do whatever I want as long as I don't cause undue harm to you. You're al I'm allowed to harm you. You can't get through the day without harming somebody in some way. I mean, just uh, somebody will misinterpret a look or a, 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 a remark you make and take offense. So, so yeah, you, you can't insist on zero harm to others, but you shouldn't insist that you have a right to cause unreasonable harm to others. So. Why should you regulate smoking? Because if you smoke, that means every peer group that you belong to has one more smoker in it. And that means everybody who's in one of those peer groups is more likely to start smoking than he would be or she would be if you weren't a smoker. And does that cause harm to others? That makes me a parent way less likely to be able to raise my kids to be non-smokers. And that's serious harm to others compared to the harm to you of having to pay a tax on the cigarettes you buy. What's the harm to you if you have to pay a tax on the cigarettes you buy? There are actually studies of that. The people who smoke, as I mentioned earlier, most of them wish they didn't smoke. It's easier to quit if cigarettes cost $10 a pack than if they cost 25 cents a pack because there'll be fewer smokers in your group and because it'll be more expensive to you to continue to smoke. If, if. So there are actually studies that show that in jurisdictions where the cigarette tax is higher, smokers are happier in those jurisdictions than they are in the ones where the taxes are lower because the taxes help them achieve the goal they're trying to achieve. So. The, the argument that we shouldn't tax tobacco heavily is a very weak argument, never mind whether you're a liberal or a conservative or an individual rights person. It, it doesn't matter. The, the practical weight of the relevant costs and benefits on the, the sides of that argument are so imbalanced that it, it shouldn't even be a conversation. Is it okay to do that? Of course it's okay to, to tax cigarettes like that. Should, should it be okay to tax people if they get on a congested highway? Yeah, they're causing harm to others. How are they causing? They're making everybody else take longer to get where they're trying to get to. Uh, maybe they don't have to go at that time. Maybe they could go at a less crowded time. Charge them to use the highway. That's a way to give them an incentive not to go at the crowded time. So. 
Yeah, let people do what they want. That's a good thing. We don't want to mess with people, uh, pass rules and, and make life hard for people. But you shouldn't be able to do things that cause unreasonable harm to others. Anybody think that's unreasonable? Come and talk to me. Send, send me an email explaining why that's unreasonable. Uh, I'd love to hear your opinion if you think that's unreasonable. It's, because it isn't unreasonable. Uh, it's totally reasonable. Okay.